emotion. A woman in my class at Columbia Business School, Lisa Stepan, had a five-year-old daughter who fell in the kitchen on a Saturday morning, catching her forehead on the sharp corner of the kitchen table. The child, Aubrey, was hysterical. The child's grandfather, Lisa's father, was hysterical. Aubrey clearly had to go to the hospital to get stitches. But she refused to go clinging to the table for dear life. No one could pry her little fingers off the kitchen table. Lisa was about to become hysterical too. When she suddenly stopped, she said to herself, Wait a minute, I'm taking a negotiation course. I'm going to negotiate this. So Lisa walked over to her daughter and touched her gently on the arm. Does your mommy love you? Lisa asked. Yes, her daughter sniffled, coming down. Would mommy do anything to hurt you? Her mother asked. No, her daughter said. When we get to be big people, do we have to do things sometimes that we don't like to do? Her mother asked. Yes, Aubrey said. Mommy has stitches, Lisa said. She showed her scar. Granddaddy has stitches, she said. Lisa's father showed Aubrey his scar. And within five minutes, her daughter let go of the table and walked to the car by herself. Here are something that we know for sure about this event. First, Aubrey's refusal to go to the hospital was entirely irrational. It was in Aubrey's interest to go to the hospital and get there quickly, but as in millions of negotiations every day, she wasn't being rational. The second thing this story shows is that we must start a negotiation thinking about the picture in the head of the other party. <coughs> Lisa's goal was to get Aubrey to the hospital without traumatizing her further. The mother realized that the picture in Aubrey's head was, I'm hurting and alone, I need love. So having considered what are my goals and who are they, the mother thinks, what will it take to persuade Aubrey? So Lisa asks, Does mommy love you? The question shows her daughter that her mother understands that her daughter needs love. Lisa throws her daughter out as Aubrey answers the question. Lisa then realizes her daughter is probably thinking, Okay, mommy loves me, but I'm in pain. So her mother asked, Would mommy do anything to hurt you? And Aubrey realizes that her mother is thinking about her daughter's pain too. This whole process is incremental. Starting from the mother thinking about the pictures in the child's head to achieving the mother's goals. It doesn't take very long it happens step by step, and in the end, and within five minutes, Aubrey walks to the car of her own free will, rather than being dragged, kicking, and screaming. A more common and more traumatic way to do it. In sum, what Lisa gave Aubrey was a series of emotional payments. They directly addressed Aubrey's fears and showed her that her mother understood. 
In other situations, the emotional payment could be an apology, words of empathy, or a concession. It could just be hearing out someone who is upset. Emotional payment have the impact of calming people down. They get people to listen and be ready to think more about their own welfare. They start from irrationality and move people little by little toward a better result, if not a rational one. Emotion and negotiation. Emotion is the enemy of effective negotiation and of effective negotiator. <clears throat> People who are emotional stop listening. They often become unpredictable and rarely are able to focus on their goals. Because of that, they often hurt themselves and don't meet their goals. Movies often show scenes of impassioned speeches, suggesting these are highly effective. Whether that is realistic depends on whether the speaker is so emotional that he or she is not thinking clearly. Emotion used here is when one is so overcome with one's own feelings that he or she stops listening and is often self-destructive. The person can no longer focus on his or her goals and needs. Empathy, by contrast, is when one is focused on the feelings of the other person. It means being compassionate and sympathetic. In other words, emotion is about you. Emotion is about the other party. Empathy is highly effective. Emotion is not. Genuine displays of emotion, love, sadness, joy are of course part of life. But it is important to recognize that these emotions, while real, reduce listening and therefore are not useful in negotiation, where processing information is critical. People feeling such emotions are almost always observed in the moment for solace and gratification. The goal is not necessarily reaching the best outcome, the long term, and the broader world often is it. The feelings can be needed and important, but not effective to reach well considered results. Indeed, emotions have often been used to push people to do things they later regret. Including testing physical limits, which can be dangerous since emotional people are less immune to self-harm. In contrast to the above, the emotion strategies in getting more are designed to enhance relationships, both personally and in business. The premise of this chapter is that it is possible to be dispassionate and compassionate at the same time. By reducing the emotional content, I learned that negotiations are not tests of sentiment, but rather an opportunity to systematically define the path to success, said Umber Ahmed, a former Goldman Sachs vice president, provided in a documentary about up and coming women in the Wall Street finance. She added that the tools of getting more are particularly important in showing many women how to become more dispassionate. Here are some of the things that cause emotion in a negotiation. When the other party misrepresents or lies about themselves or the fact and makes false accusation breaks commitment, agreement, or won't make them. Devalues the other party 
by insulting, threatening, being hostile, causing loss of faith, going over their head, questioning their authority or credibility, blaming people, blaming them. His greed or self-centered makes excessively high demands, oversteps their authority, doesn't reciprocate goodly, doesn't thank you for a gift, is undisciplined, doesn't adequately prepare, is inconsistent, loses control, personally or professionally, dashes the other person's expectations, fail to show up for a meeting, treats others unfairly. When people get emotional, here is what happens. Instead of focusing on goals, interests, and needs, and effectively communicating, emotional people focus on punishment, revenge, and retaliation. Deals fail, goals are met, judgment is clouded, and people don't meet their needs. Emotion destroys negotiation and image creativity. Focus is lost, decision making is poor, retaliation often occurs. Emotion in negotiation has received increasing attention since 1990. Researchers, teachers, and practitioners began to realize one had to address the emotional side of people, but uh, not just the rational side. The results of this attention have generally been mixed and not always helpful. For example, there has been a trend suggesting that it is okay to feign emotions such as anger and approval to get others to do what you want. This is, of course, dishonest and usually manipulative. The tactic aims to get other people emotional so they are scared or flattered into doing something they would not otherwise do, and which too often is not in their best interest. The tactics are called things like strategic emotion, first positive feedback, and a display of fury to extract a concession, on-demand emotional expression, tactical emotion, impression management, strategically angry and emotion manipulation. These are variations of good cop and bad cop. They destabilize situation and make them unpredictable. They often aim to get the other party to make a mistake, such as disclosing information that can be used against them. That's why people hold insults or wave obnoxious banners as sports figures during games. The object is to get the players angry and emotional so they get distracted and lose focus on their goals, that is, to execute effectively to win the game. Most of the advice on using emotion to manipulate a negotiation doesn't consider the long-term effects on the relationship, which usually ends when the manipulator is found out. Credibility and trust take a big hit. If you find the other party displaying false emotion just to get you to act in a certain way, I suggest that you never dare meet them again if you can help it. View anyone who feigns emotion to get something out of you as a cheat. In the most extreme case, terrorist leaders convince some of their followers to blow themselves up to satisfy an emotional need for revenge or a heavenly reward. In whose interest is this? not bystanders who become victims, and not the person blowing up himself or herself. 
the beneficiaries are terrorist leaders who get political aggrandizement without physical harm. They get additional fundings from others who are equally emotional. Some people point out times when they have used emotions as negotiation tools and they have worked. The problem is that they are risky and unpredictable in terms of the results and cynical and untrustworthy in terms of attitude. They destroy relationship, demand to take it or leave it, increase rejection rates. Studies show people perceive them as unfair and will sometimes reject who deals out of spite. On half as many offers are accepted when negative emotion is used. One can see this in business. A customer of Richard Holland threatened to switch vendors because of price increase. You even after the increase, Richard's prices were less than those of their of other vendors. When the other person is mad at you, they may do things just for spite, said Richard, an industrial accounting manager. So Richard decided he would be much more empathetic to customers about their rising costs. He asked customers how this company could add more value in exchange for a price increase. It worked. Empathy and consultation were emotional payment. And let's look more specifically at what the introduction of emotion often does to a negotiation. First, they stabilize the situation. You are much less sure of how the other person is going to react. The outcome is less predictable when the parties are emotional. Emotion reduces people's information processing ability. That means they don't take the time to explore creative options. They don't look at all the facts and circumstances. They don't look for ways to expand the pie. As a result, they don't get more. In fact, emotional people, studies show, care less about getting a deal than which their needs than about hurting the other party. It is true that positive emotion have been shown to increase creativity and the likelihood of reaching an agreement. But such negotiations are often conducted at a pitch and with a fervor that are risky. You've seen an ebullient group. Suddenly, turn on people, turn on someone or something that had previously been the object of their affections. That kind of instability should worry you. Try to conduct negotiations that are calm and stable. Warm feelings, perhaps, but laced with solid judgment. The emotional temperature needs to calm down if you want to meet your goals and solve thorny problems. What about the strategy of good cop and bad cop? This is a favorite tool that participants in negotiation courses say they use. The police use this tactic to try to destabilize a suspect by causing emotion. They hope the suspect will make a mistake and make an admission against their goals and interests. So yes anger and emotion work in a situation 
where you want to try to harm the other party and get them to make a mistake. Unless that's your goal, you probably don't want to use anger as a negotiation tool. Another problem with using emotion on purpose is that the more you use it, the less effective it becomes. If you raise your voice or shout once a year, it can be very effective. If you do it once a month, you become known as the screamer and you lose credibility. This applies to working out of negotiation as well. A tone change is fine once in a while. If you're normally quiet every once in a while, you might raise your voice. If you are normally a pretty uh, loud person, once in a while you might be especially quiet or soft spoken. But such tactics must be well thought out and measured. Negotiations are more effective when they are stable and predictable. Emotion producing tactics. To listen to many negotiations, one would think that threats are the method of choice, but threats are one of the least effective negotiation strategies. Threats cause people to get emotional, making them less able to see things clearly, enough to do what you want them to do. Since emotion, makes people less resistant to self-harm, your target will likely not care as much about your threats as you like them to. Studies show that people who threat are only half as likely to reach an agreement as those who don't, and with the very same facts. So, why do people threaten? Lack of negotiating experience was key. When people try to force you to do things, you lose faith. In some cultures, loss of faith has driven people to acts of violence, including murder and suicide. Losing faith, in turn, is tied to self-esteem and self-worth. So, threats cause loss of faith. The result is resistance. Related to threats is another common but ineffective negotiation tactics. Take it or leave it. It causes people to get upset and fear agreement result. Here is a study on the take it or leave it approach. Researchers told the subject that he or she would be given $10 to divide with another person, but the other person had to agree to the split. If the other person rejected the offer, both parties would get nothing. When the other person was offered one dollar, meaning the offer would get nine dollars, 75% of the other people rejected the offer. Now, this makes no rational sense. It's better to go home with one dollar than with nothing, but the unfairness of someone else getting most of the amount available could cause them to act emotionally against their goals and interests. On the other hand, 95% of the other people agreed to the split when it was done 50-50. But when $3 was offered, two-thirds of the other people rejected that. As such, you must take the rationality into account when deciding how to approach others. If the other person is likely to act irrationally, you need to offer emotional payment 
you need to make adjustment. One example of adjustment is collaborative threats. In a normal threat, you tell the other person, if you don't lower your price, I'm going to someone else. Often, the other person will become emotional and respond with something like, go jump in the lake. Although, it would be better for them to lower their prices and keep you as a customer, you made them react emotionally by flexing your power with them. Another, another way to frame this is to say, I really like you guys. I've been buying from you for some time, but now some of your competitors are offering us more value. We'd like to stay with you. What should we do? The same threat to live is inherent. When you're asking for their help, how do we stay in business together? It is framed in the context of a relationship and it opens the way for more creative solution. By reframing and essentially giving them the problem, you have reduced the emotion and improved the result. You've made the situation a common problem to solve together. You have valued them more. Controlling emotion. <clears throat> so, how do you control emotion in a negotiation? There are two kinds of people to think about, you and others. I've talked a bit about the other person's emotion already. We'll pick that up again shortly. But let's address your own emotion. If you are emotional, you are no good to anyone in a negotiation. If you start to get emotional, stop. Take a break. Calm yourself down. If you can, perhaps you are not, not the right negotiator, at least at the moment. Take a longer break until you can calm down, or it needs the help of someone else. If you try to negotiate when you are upset, angry, or otherwise emotional, you lose sight of your goals and needs, and you will make yourself the issue. You can try to take this issue away by saying, I'm feeling emotional now, so I might, I might not mean everything I say. This works best if they then emphasize. Exquisite preparation is a defense against losing sight of your goals. If you start to get upset, Reveal the materials you have prepared may calm you down. Lower your expectation. If you come into a negotiation thinking that the other side will be difficult, unfair, rude, or try to cheat you, you won't be likely to have dashed expectation. You won't be as emotional. When you lower your expectation of what will take place in a negotiation, you will be rarely disappointed, and you might be pleasantly surprised. Getting yourself psychologically prepared is important. You might feel, hey, I shouldn't have to do things like that. Okay, maybe not. But we live in the real world, not in the should world. If you follow these tools, you will gradually make your negotiation better. Other people will behave better. The results will be better. Slowly, the world will become better. The human race has lived a certain way for thousands of years. Don't expect it to change overnight. Remember that great expression, revenge is a dash 
best serve the court. When everyone else around you is angry, it doesn't help to join that. Don't let your emotions match theirs. A colleague once said, just because you are in a insane at asylum doesn't mean you want crazy doctors. Say to yourself, they are trying to get me to take the focus off my goals. Don't let others manipulate you into getting less or getting nothing at all. Getting mad at someone destroys your goals. It's like saying, I'm mad at you. I think I will not kill myself. Don't let the other side cause you to hurt yourself. I once saw two attorneys with their clients outside a courthouse. One attorney was screaming at the other attorney and his client in an endless tiring. The attorney on the receiving end just stood there with his client silently listening. Finally, the attorney who bore the brunt of this looked at the other attorney and said in a light voice, Good try. It completely destroyed the effectiveness of the outburst. So you can control your own emotion. Dealing with the emotions of others can be trickier. Dealing with emotional situations and emotional people. Recognize when others are acting against their goals and needs. Try to understand the other party's emotion and perceptions. Find the cause of their emotion and their needs and goals. Consider well whether your negotiating style is contributing to the situation. Make emotional payment, concession, apologies, empathy. Try to create trust. Avoid extreme statements. They just produce more emotion. Use third parties and their constituents to help you. Operate their standards. Correct erroneous facts. The first step toward dealing effectively with the emotions of others is to recognize when they are being emotional. It is not always obvious which and sweetest, for example, are culturally less emotive than Brazilian and Italians. But that doesn't mean any individuals in those cultures is less or more emotional. Some people are calm outside and see things inside and vice versa. The key is whether the other person is acting against his or her own interests, needs, and goals. You have probably watched people do exactly the opposite of what benefits them. You ask yourself, what's wrong with them? Can they see this one? Help them. They can. They have lost focus on their goals and needs. They are being emotional. They aren't listening clearly. To persuade them, you have to begin by increasing their ability to listen. That means you have to calm them down. You have to become their emotional confidant try to understand their emotions. What gave rise to them? What can you do to calm them down? You've had heated discussion with your friends, partners, and spouse. The more you tell them to calm down, the madder they get. That's because hiring them to 
to calm down the values, the legitimacy of their emotions. And when people feel the values, they become more emotional. So emphasize with them. Try to understand the cause of their emotion. It doesn't work to simply tell them, be rational or be logical. If they wanted to be logical or rational, they would be. They want to be emotional, so commiserate with them. This will usually calm them down enough to have a conversation together. The more you listen to them, the calmer they will be. You have to figure out what kind of emotional payment they need. Each one of repeated requests from women to men. I don't want you to solve my problems. I just want you to listen to them. For many women, being listened to is the emotional payment. Anything that values their emotion through some demonstration by you is an emotional payment. It could be a compliment. It could be a touch on the arm. It could be just listening. It's different for every person. So first, you have to try to understand the pictures in their heads. I first discovered the impact of emotional pain much about 20 years ago when I was involved with the Harvard negotiation project. Both there are elsewhere, both there and elsewhere in the negotiation industry. People are talking about negotiation strategies for regional people, rational actors, and wise negotiators. All around me, however, I saw evidence of a rationality driving decision from children to business to government. Students, professionals, and others kept asking how to deal with a rational and emotional people. I then realized that almost all the studies were dealing only with the world as it should be, not as it was. So I started developing tools and strategies to deal with emotions. Shortly after that, I mediated a high society divorce in New York. The husband had hired male lawyers to whom he was paying a lot of money. The wife had hired female lawyers who were working pro bono. The asset, which had been large initially, had been whittled down through legal fees and losses in the stock market. When I was asked to assist, the couple still had about $400,000 left in assets. The husband was basically ready to just give his wife all the money at the divorce settlement. The divorce was a continuous drain on his business. But she refused to take it. She was so angry at him that she wanted to rake him over the court in court, embarrass him, and leaving everyone with nothing. She was clearly emotional. She was acting against her own interest. So I thought about what I could give her that she would recognize as an emotional payment, she would take the money. One day, as I sat with her, I said, you know, if you take the settlement offer, it will be all the money he has. She thought about this for a moment and said, do you mean to say if I take this settlement offer, it will be all the money that Sarah Beach has, I said. Yes, she said. I'll take it. She wanted. 
the whole own mind for him to feel pain. And this was an emotional payment for her. To find out what the other party might consider to be an emotional payment, you need to focus hard on the picture in their heads. How do they view the world? What are their needs and perceptions? How would they like to hear things from? Do they need concessions? If so, what kind of simple apology? An elaborate apology, no apology, but flowers. In other words, emotional payment are very specific to, pers to the person and the situation. Special Romney, a panel student, was on the phone with his wife, Lisa, a dentist. She was trying to tell him about her stressful day. I was with friends and distracted, he said. He got mad, hung up, and refused to answer my calls when he got home. He immediately started to give her a foot massage without saying anything. Then he asked her about her day, please start. Only when you get the other person to start listening can you do things that will begin to bring them back. What standards have they used before? Standards they might not accept. Using standards first would be too much for them to handle in their emotional state. First, they have to be ready to handle possible contradictions, and you must avoid extreme statements, including threat. They are emotion producers. One idea is to get them talking about themselves so they can vent or express their feelings. Try guessing at things that may be bothering them. They'll often tell you that you are right or wrong. Ask a question. The mere act of considering a question takes energy from their emotional feet. As we, the child, at the start of this chapter, Articulate what you think is the other party's pain. Even if you are wrong, you'll have a calming effect even as they look inward to see if you are right. Jim O'Toole and his wife, Anne, were having an argument about how little time he was spending with her or their two children. He had a full-time job and was pursuing an advanced degree. For once, I decided to take the card and just let her tell me her side of things completely, he said. As she talked, she became calmer. So did he. Clearly, they all wanted to spend more time together. Then I reviewed my current obligation and how it would provide a long-term benefit to all of us, said Jim. Now, president of paper distribution company in Chicago, she was much more understanding than in the past. With their argument over, they had begun a new communication process for the future. Doctors are beginning to see that apologizing to patients for mistake or for less than perfect care goes a long way toward avoiding lawsuit. Traditionally, <clears throat> attorneys and insurers have seen any apology as an admission of liability. This is not necessarily, necessarily true. Things can happen that only with hindsight seem wrong. And even if there is a liability, you can be sure that if medical professionals empathize, the patient or a patient kid will be less out for blood. In Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, Giyad al Sare was in the process of buying a food industry company. The owner was reluctant to sell, even though he knew 
the offer was a good one, he was fearful of losing control and thus emotional. Jiak said, the solution was to first talk with the owner about his fears. They also offered him a key position in the firm with some job security. Thought they gave him a vision of a global expansion. <clears throat> Finally, they pledged extra compensation if he could help turn the vision into reality. The owner saw that with additional people, he would be able to accomplish something he had been unable to accomplish on his own due to, lack, due to his lack of size and resources, so he agreed to the deal. Mark Robinson, a student at the University of Southern California Business School, drove to a jewelry store with his wife to pick up her engagement ring which had been repaired. The store was in a fairly tough area of Los Angeles. It was hard to find a parking space relatively close to the store. Mark saw someone walking toward the parked car. So Mark pulled ahead of the car, patiently waiting for the parked car to leave. At what seemed like an eternity, the parked car left, pulling around Mark, waiting to back in. As he started to back in, another car came up from behind, pulled into the space. Inside were two tough-looking guys. Mark decided to negotiate the situation. His wife was horrified. My wife wanted me to drop the matter, Mark said. I, on the other hand, focused on the other driver. Maybe he didn't see me. Maybe this was negotiable. Come, Mark got out of the car and walked over to the two tough guys. He went to the driver's side window, smiled and waved. Hi, he said. After a few seconds, the driver rolled down the window. Yeah, he said. I spoke to him like we were acquaintances, Mark said. I said, you probably didn't see me patiently waiting for the space but I've been here for a long time. <clears throat> Would you allow me to have the space? He gestured to his wife. I was hoping not to look bad in front of my wife, he said. It's up to you, but I appreciate anything you might do. The two guys looked at each other and then at this guy. Clearly, he was not dead. He accused him of nothing. Moreover, he gave them a chance to be magnanimous. Okay, man, we are cool with that, one said. Mark shook the driver's hand. The driver then started his car and pulled away. Surprised? Well, Mark had given them a big emotional payment one that the guys could tell their friends about how they had some guy not look bad in front of his wife. <laughs> My wife was in shock for some time about the power of this process. Mark told me afterwards, if this feels uncomfortable or dangerous to you, then don't do it. But the student presented his argument in a way that carried very little risk. He tapped into the other guy's psyches. So if you feel this tool won't work in a given situation, ask yourself if you are using the right tools. A student at Walton was head of 
that comfort in West Philadelphia. He gave the rap for his word and said, I'm probably not even worth wasting your gun on. We'll make too much noise. We are the boss. In the end, the robber gave the student back his driver's license and student ID card. They were unusual to the robber, and the student said, We all know those SOB in the bureaucracy gave everyone a hard time of this stuff. Common enemies. Why did he do that? When do you think the last time was that the robber heard anyone say to him, you're the boss? What news of emotion in a negotiation is to bond people together. People who have been through an emotional ordeal tend to bond together. This is true if the experience is a negative one such as war, an accident, or danger, or a positive one, such as winning a big sporting event. While it can be a basis for team building, and use the wrong name, it can leave lasting scars. It is like playing with a fire. What about when you have tried to get through to the other person and, and are unable to? Think about all the parties. Who might? the other person or party trust enough to listen to if not you. Do they have friends, colleagues, or constituents who might be able to calm them down? Are there third parties you can blame in an attempt to unite the other person around common enemies? If all else fails, are there more rational people on the other side you can appeal to? For example, if you are dealing with a company or a team, rather than an individual, it may be easier to find more corporate people going over the, the head of the emotional person carries with it the risk that he or she will retaliate. And that we will destroy the relationships. In personal situations, this is not advisable. In business situation, it sometimes is necessary. If you have an emotional extreme person on the other side in a business negotiation, ask every other member of the other team if they agree with each and every word, in tone and substance, that was just said. Make your tone one of trying to understand the situation. It is not accusatory. If there is any hesitation by the other side, ask for a break. Telling the other side to take a break is too aggressive. During the break, hopefully members of the other side will calm down the emotional person or exclude them from the negotiation. You also need to recognize when someone is using emotion to manipulate a negotiation and do something about it. I tend to mistrust the general phrase, you are a great teacher in my view, it's just a throw away line. In what way? I want to know what specifically did you learn that's valuable. I want to see if they are just joking for position or good grade. Are they trying to manipulate me or sincerely expressing appreciation? If you see the other side playing good card, bad card on you, ask them directly, are you playing good card, bad card with me? Call out the bad behavior. Why you might want to say, I see that your approaches to me are very different. One is nice, the other is not. Do you want to take a break and get your approaches straight? This is also shows why manipulation is risky. Good negotiator will call it out 
and the manipulator will lose credibility. Deadlines and time limits are often used to hurt the other party emotionally. With deadlines and deadlines looming, people are less able to process information, less interested in expanding the pie, and less creative. If someone imposes a deadline on you, ask if they would like such negative things to occur. Better yet, find out any deadlines in the beginning, so you can manage your time not settle for a less than deal. Having enough time to be creative is essentially have enough time to get more. Some negotiators suggest that you start with an extreme demand to leave room for concessions. When you make an extreme demand, the other party will almost always say no. The thinking is that you can then make a more modest demand, which seems more reasonable and acceptable. This is just another manipulative tactic. If someone tries that on you, say something like, so how come you change your first offer so much? Put them in the hot seat for trying to manipulate you. The net result of such tactics, though, is that trust and the chance of deal both go down. Be careful of being too aggressive in naming bad behavior, as you noted earlier. Then there are food and gifts, cookie, trinkets, or more. A lunch at a fancy restaurant. This is supposed to soft up the other side and make them indebted to you. To break the ice in a negotiation, it's fine. In trading items, it's fine. But you have to evaluate the source. If the other side is being genuine, okay, but make sure they don't later try to exact a concession in turn. Ask yourself if their actions seem genuine, if you think they are feigning an emotion. Ask yourself what kind of relationship you are going to have if they are acting this way. Such manipulative tactics are often used by hard bargainers. I went to Springdale, Arkansas for negotiation with Tyson Foods, the giant food company, on behalf of a Russian client who owed Tyson millions of dollars. They did not try to kill me with kindness, quite the contrary. Under the guise of showing me around, they gave me a tour of the chicken processing plant. I heard one of the executives whispered to another before the tour, should we show him the kill room? The other said, absolutely. I'll spare you the details of the tour of the slater house. Afterwards, they took me into a conference room in the Slater house where they had a lunch of, you guessed it, southern fried chicken. I made sure that I had stilled myself and expressed delight at the offering. I also made sure I ate more southern fried chicken than anyone else in the room. These kinds of manipulative tactics are meant to take advantage of unskilled negotiators. They don't work on skilled negotiators. This pleasure of rudeness, fake emotion, anger, and other be bad behavior, such as violence, can be gotten away with if the negotiator has a vast amount of power over the other party. Remember, not all negotiations are solvable. To deal with such emotional violence, first try to use the tools in this book, find their needs, use standards, try for relationship using third parties that could influence them, make emotional payment, understand their perception, and so forth. They might not be conscious of their behavior 
and may be willing to listen to you. Or they may be Machiavellian and lucky. If none of these work, try to remove yourself from the situation. Don't be a punching bag. They are trying to hurt you and don't care about you. Many plausible tactics run the risk of creating instability. When the person being manipulated, manipulated comes to their senses, and I say when, not if, they will know they've been manipulated. These kinds of short-term strategies eventually backfire. Even if the other side is being extreme, your remaining calm will give you more options. With a little humor, sometimes, and questions, you can turn an entire crowd around. Stuart Mello, a former student, sent me this anecdote. A couple of years ago, he said, one of my wife's horses ran away and came to rest on the property of the most disagreeable redneck in our country in the middle of his birthday party. When I showed up, he came out into the yard, drunk, demanding payment for damage that the horse had allegedly caused to his truck. Very quickly, we were surrounded by his family and friends, most of whom had been drinking. Frankly, I was concerned for my safety, but then I thought of your teaching and calmly asked him to show me the damage. He pointed to a dent on the driver's side, the manager lower, and his truck was covered with the things and that. So I just started asking questions without any judgment or emotion. Stuart recalled, are you sure it was this dent and not that one? What about these other dents? If the horse caused this dent, how did it get rusty so fast? By the time I was done, the crowd was roaring with laughter and he retreated. We got the horse back without further instant, he added. I used these tools constantly. Mm -hmm.